Dorothy Eady might not be among the first people that come to mind when you think about great figures of the 20th century, but she should be. Not only did her astonishing life help form the foundation of modern Egyptology and the understanding of ancient people, which now appears in our history books, but it gave us something which went far beyond that. Simply, in Dorothy Eady's life is the evidence to settle a long-standing debate, stunning proof of the existence of reincarnation. Sound impossible? In this video, we'll tell you her story and give you the incredible proof. But in fact, there's more. Look closer at the life of Dorothy Eady and what begins to emerge are secrets about ancient Egypt and indeed human history that we've never even imagined possible. Dorothy Eady was born in 1904 into a lower middle class family in the Blackheath suburb of London, England. For the first few years of her life, she was a decidedly normal child, curious and energetic, the apple of her parents' eye. That was until she was three years old, when a terrible accident took place. One day, while playing, Dorothy slipped and fell down the stairs at her family home, her body tumbling down the long wooden staircase, coming to rest in a crumpled, motionless heap at the bottom. When a physician arrived and checked her for vital signs, the news was not good. Little Dorothy was dead. The physician slowly moved Dorothy's lifeless body into a spare room laying it gently on the bed and leaving to compose a death certificate. When he returned an hour later, he found something shocking. Dorothy was sitting up in bed playing with a toy, very much alive and apparently no worse for wear. Her parents were overcome with joy. They didn't care whether the physician had made a terrible mistake or if a miracle really had taken place in their home. They were just happy that their little girl had returned to them. There was only one problem. As the days passed, it became clear that a change had taken place in little Dorothy. She began to have inexplicable emotional outbursts, crying and hiding under the family's dining room table, repeating again and again, I want to go home. Moreover, she began to wake up in the middle of the night, describing vivid dreams of a huge stone building with tall columns and beautiful exotic gardens, and again crying that she wanted to be taken home. When her parents asked her where home was, she could not answer, only saying that she wanted to go there. No matter how many times her parents insisted, she already was home. With little idea of what to do, Dorothy's parents simply tried to make the best of it, hoping that whatever her accident had done to her, it would pass. Almost a year later, they decided to take Dorothy on a trip to the British Museum. For most of the trip, Dorothy seemed disinterested, walking silently through the exhibits with her head hung. That was until they reached an exhibit on ancient Egypt, and without warning, Dorothy tore herself away from her mother's grip and began running through the statues of Egyptian gods, stopping in front of each, kneeling and kissing their feet. Finally, she reached a mummy in a glass case and was stopped in her tracks. Saying nothing, she sat down in front of it, staring deeply into the mummy's face as her parents watched with concern for some 30 minutes. When finally, her mother and father attempted to pull her away, telling her it was time to leave, she turned to them and bawled. Leave me here. These are my people. A few months later, Dorothy was looking through photographs of Egypt in a magazine when suddenly her eyes locked on a picture of the Abydos Temple of Seti I. The more she stared, the more she was certain it was the place she'd seen so many times in her dreams. She ran to her father and showed him the picture, confidently exclaiming, This is my home. This is where I used to live. And asking, But where are the trees? Where is the garden? While her father tried to assure her that it was not her home, that in fact she'd never even been to Egypt, the idea of this home did not leave her head. In fact, it became something of an obsession for Dorothy Eady, one which made her childhood exceedingly difficult. First, she was banned from Sunday school after upsetting the other children by constantly comparing Christianity to the ancient Egyptian religion. Then, she was expelled from her private girl's school for refusing to sing a hymn which called on God to curse the swart Egyptians. 
She was even kicked out of Catholic Mass after she told a priest she enjoyed it because it reminded her of the old religion. Eventually, Dorothy began to lose interest in formal education altogether, so she took to skipping school and going to the British Museum instead. There, barely 10 years old, Dorothy would walk through the galleries, looking at exhibits and reading everything she could. Eventually, this strange little girl who seemed so obsessed with ancient Egypt was noticed by one of the staff at the museum, a man named E. A. Wallace Budge. Of course, Budge was not just any other staff member. He was THE staff member, the curator of Egyptian and Assyrian antiquities at the British Museum, and indeed an internationally known leader in the field. During his many trips to Egypt, Budge had basically built the British Museum's entire collection of Egyptian artifacts himself, publishing numerous works on the subject while earning honorary doctorates from universities like Cambridge and Oxford. In fact, by the time he noticed Dorothy Eady hanging around at the museum, he was only a few years away from receiving a knighthood. Despite being such an important figure, Budge took an interest in Dorothy Eady, whom he watched from afar for some time as she returned again and again. It's possible that his interest was piqued because in her he saw a little bit of himself. Budge had become interested in ancient languages before he was 10 years old, dropping out of school at 12 and, like Dorothy Eady, spending every spare moment at the exhibits at the British Museum. There he had been noticed by Samuel Birch, the curator of Oriental Antiquities at the museum at the time, who had taken an interest in Budge, allowing him to study the museum's archives and connecting him with powerful benefactors that would lead Budge to Cambridge University and his legendary career. Perhaps in Dorothy Eady, he saw an opportunity to pay back the favor, to help a child with an ancient obsession, just as someone at the museum had done for him. And so, one day, Budge approached Dorothy and offered to teach her hieroglyphics, an opportunity she excitedly accepted. As their lessons began, Budge was stunned by Dorothy's ability. Simply, the girl was something of a prodigy. What it took adult scholars many years to master, Dorothy was able to pick up in only a few months. When Budge asked her how she was doing this, she told him that it was because she had known it all before and that she was not learning it, but rather it was simply coming back to me. It may have seemed like an unbelievable assertion to many, but in Budge, Dorothy had an audience more receptive to the idea than most. See, Budge was not just a legendary scholar, but a man noted for his deep interest in the supernatural and paranormal. He was known to believe in spirits and hauntings, even asserting that he himself had special gifts as a conduit of the spirit world. Perhaps it was not just that he saw something of himself in Dorothy Eady. Perhaps it was that when she spoke of a home in Egypt and having known hieroglyphics before, he believed her story. In any case, Budge and Dorothy Eady continued to study together at the museum through her early teen years until, as World War I hit and bombs began to drop on London, she was sent to live on her grandmother's farm in Sussex for safety. Luckily for her, she was able to find more books about Egypt at the local public library there and continue her studies. As she got older, it became clear that her obsession with ancient Egypt was not just a childhood phase. In fact, as she moved into her teen years, things only got more bizarre. At 14, she began having two recurring dreams. In the first, she was ravished by the Egyptian pharaoh Seti I the builder of the Abydos temple, which she called her home. As she described, I half woke up, feeling a weight on my chest. Then I fully woke up, and I saw this face bending over me with both hands on the neck of my nightdress. I recognized the face from the photo I had seen years before of the mummy Seti. I was astonished and shocked, and I cried out, and yet I was overjoyed. It's difficult to explain. It was the feeling of something you have waited for that has come home at last. In the second dream, more of a nightmare, she was in the dark being interrogated by some sort of priest who beat her with his fists when she didn't answer his questions. She had no idea what these dreams meant or how they were related, but they got stronger and stronger, returning more and more frequently as she got older. Unsurprisingly, her parents were extremely concerned, especially given the graphic nature of the dreams. 
and so they resorted to committing her to a series of sanatoriums, which they hoped would help her. Over and over she was committed, yet no treatment ever made the dreams go away, and no doctor could ever convince her to forget her delusions of ancient Egypt and her supposed home. Into adulthood, her obsession continued. She would become a part-time student at an art school where she would work on ancient Egyptian pieces and join a theater group which performed the ancient Egyptian play of Isis and Osiris, all the while visiting museums, libraries, and archaeological sites across England whenever she could. By 27, she had gotten a job at a London-based Egyptian public relations magazine where she wrote articles and drew cartoons supporting Egypt's independence movement. It was during this time that she met a young man named Inman Abdel Megwid, an Egyptian student and political activist. The two of them fell in love, and when he returned to Egypt, they would continue to correspond for more than a year until finally he proposed marriage. Thrilled, Dorothy Eady accepted, and at 29, she booked passage on a ship and headed to Egypt to be with him and start her new life. When she finally arrived and her feet touched the soil of Egypt for the first time, she fell to her knees and kissed the ground, weeping, feeling that she was finally home. In short order, Edie would become pregnant and give birth to a son, whom she insisted they call Seti. At this point, Edie had every opportunity to settle into a comfortable life in Cairo as a wife and mother, finally home where she had always wanted to be. But, in fact, this is not what happened at all. All of a sudden, Edie began waking up in the middle of the night in a trance-like state and scribbling down pages and pages of hieroglyphics on pieces of paper. When her concerned husband asked her what she was doing, she told him that she was being visited by a spirit guide named Hor Ra, who was dictating to her the story she had always wanted to know, the story of her past life in Egypt. Over the course of more than a year, Edie would compile more than 70 pages of hieroglyphs. The story was incredible, and for Edie, it tied everything together. It started in the city of Abydos during the reign of Pharaoh Seti I, around 1300 BCE. When a little girl was born into a humble family, her father a soldier in Seti's army, her mother a vegetable seller. They called her Bentrigit. At the age of three, tragedy struck Bentrishit. While her father was away on campaign, her mother died of an illness. Unable to care for a little girl, her father was forced to give her into the care of a local temple. There she lived throughout childhood until, at twelve, she was given a choice to head out into the world or become a consecrated virgin and priestess of the temple. She chose the latter, taking her vows and beginning life as a priestess. A few years later, Ben Trigit was strolling through the garden of the newly built Abydos Temple, when suddenly she came face to face with the pharaoh Seti himself. The pharaoh was enamored with this beautiful girl, and in short order they became lovers, meeting in the garden constantly to consummate their love. As might be expected, their affair resulted in Ben Trigit getting pregnant, when her belly began to swell, she was interrogated by the high priest and beaten until she revealed the name of the father. The priest informed her that the punishment for her sin was death. And so, to avoid her beloved pharaoh facing the repercussions of their affair becoming public, Bentrigit decided to take her own life. This was the story Edie recorded about a past life which explained her inherent feeling of Egypt as her home her recurring dreams of Pharaoh Seti as her lover, and nightmares of being beaten by a priest, her unnatural talents with hieroglyphics. And yet, in revealing this story, Dorothy Eady was met only with skepticism. This was perhaps not all that surprising. At the time, claims of past lives, and specifically those centered around ancient Egypt, were actually not all that rare. It was a time in which the study of ancient Egypt was becoming popular in England and the West, with new museum exhibits appearing constantly and the debate over Egyptian independence in the newspaper daily. Moreover, a popular genre of novel had emerged, 
romance novels centering around handsome Arabic men who would sweep young English women off their feet, often engaging in forbidden illicit activities. The result of this trend was that many had come out claiming to be reincarnated princesses or priestesses from ancient Egypt, often with stories of having engaged in illicit love affairs with royal lovers. In this context, Dorothy Eady seemed like just another eccentric woman with an unbelievable story. And yet, she had something that others making claims didn't. Something which, over the coming years, would totally change perceptions of her and her story. Dorothy Eady had proof. It was not long after Dorothy Eady finished transcribing the purported story of her past life that her husband had finally had enough. He was fed up with her trances and her wild claims, and so, after two years of marriage, the couple got divorced. Freed from the constraints of her marriage, Edie would rent an apartment close to the pyramids of Giza and begin to closely follow the ancient Egyptian religion in her daily life. She would visit the pyramids often, bringing offerings to the gods and performing rituals, or simply hanging around, drawing and recording everything she saw. She spent so much time on the Giza Plateau that she began to befriend the archaeologists who were working there, many of whom were instantly impressed with her knowledge and artistic abilities. One of the archaeologists who was particularly impressed was a man named Salim Hassan, who had just been named the director of the Egyptian Antiquities Service, in charge of overseeing the care of all monuments in the Nile Valley. For the second time in her life, Edie caught the eye of an extremely important and influential figure, and in fact, so impressed was Hassan that he offered her a position as a draftsperson and painter for the Egyptian Department of Antiquities. To understand just how unusual this was, and how impressed he must have been, when she accepted the job, Edie became the first woman ever employed by the department. Much like what had happened when E. A. Wallace Budge began to teach a young Dorothy Eady hieroglyphics, Eady proved to be something of a prodigy in her work with the Egyptian Department of Antiquities. Immediately, she became indispensable to Hassan and other archaeologists on the Giza Plateau. Indeed, when Hassan published his seminal work, Excavations at Giza, a hugely important work which continues to influence Egyptology to this day. He specifically thanked Dorothy Eady in the book for helping sketch its illustrations and edit his work, earning her a place of honor in the Egyptology community. When Hassan's project on the Giza Plateau ended, Eady was immediately offered a job with a different archaeologist, Ahmed Fakri, for an excavation at Dashur some 20 miles away where she again provided brilliant work. At the completion of this project in 1956, a 52-year-old Edi was given the option of taking either a well-paid position at the Cairo Records Office, having earned it with years of good work, or a poorly paid position as a draftsperson in the city of Abydos, where Seti's temple, which she had first claimed as her home all those years earlier, was located. For Edi, the choice was easy. As she later put it, I had only one aim in life, and that was to go to Abydos, to live in Abydos, and to be buried in Abydos. Without hesitation, she chose Abydos. Moving to an entirely new environment brought a fresh round of skepticism for Edie, new colleagues who had heard about her claims of a past life, but did not believe her. Fatefully, it was this skepticism which would give her the opportunity to finally prove the legitimacy of her proclaimed reincarnation once and for all. One day, shortly after her arrival, she was taken by the chief inspector of the antiquities department to the Abydos temple of Seti I, where she claimed to have lived in her past life. Brought inside in the pitch dark, the inspector told her that he would give her the description of a mural which she would then have to find without being able to see anything. Not only was the temple covered with a near endless number of murals, but their descriptions and locations had never been published, meaning that there was no chance she could have come across the locations during her years of study and somehow memorized them. Surely, the inspector thought, the task was impossible, one which would finally disprove her wild claims. Except, 
The first description he gave, she found immediately, then the second, then the third. On and on it went, each time Edie finding the described mural without trouble, as she later recounted. They said that they would test me. The first time I went in, they told me where to go. It was the chapel of Amon. So I went right in, and they told me to go in front of the scene of the sacred boats, which I did. Called out. They came. They found me where I was supposed to be. They said, ah, that's just chance. I said, well, try again. Well, they tried several times, and each time I was in the right place. It was as if I walked in into a place where I had lived before and knew all about it. How could this be possible? The inspector wondered. There was simply no way she could have known the locations of the murals unless she had been there before. For many, this was the long-awaited proof that Abydos really was her home, that Dorothy Edie had really lived there in a past life as Ben Trishet. Incredibly, there was even more proof to come. One day, while working with archaeologists at the Abydos Temple, Edie began talking about the garden where she and Seti had met in her past life. Thinking that they had finally found a contradiction in her story, they quickly informed her, There's no garden here. It's over there. Just go dig, she insisted, pointing to a spot archaeologists had been over many times. We know for a fact there's no garden over there, they replied. Yes, yes there is, she maintained. Please, just do it. Sure enough, as they dug into the ground, they almost immediately discovered a garden which they had somehow missed previously. More astonishingly, she was not only right about the garden's existence, but she knew its dimensions and unique features. She told archaeologists about tree types and arrangements, about water canals and columns, all of which were confirmed by excavation. Again, it seemed simply impossible that she could have known this unless she'd been there before. For many, this closed the case. Dorothy Edie was a reincarnated Egyptian priestess who had lived in the Abydos temple in a past life. Even the most skeptical of scientists wondered how could she be viewed as anything other than someone telling the truth. Having developed into something of a legend, Edie spent the rest of her career as she always had, helping researchers make breakthrough after breakthrough, and even writing her own series of well-received works on the tradition and rituals of ancient Egypt. She was so valuable that when she reached the mandatory retirement age of 60, she was given a special exception and allowed to work for five more years. Finally, she retired in 1969, living in a small hut next to the Abydos Temple, where she would regularly receive archaeologists from all over the world who wanted to pick her brain for secrets and advice, and supplementing her meager $30 a month pension by selling handicrafts to tourists and giving tours around the temple. In 1981, at the age of 77, Dorothy Edie died. She was buried in the village beside the Abydos Temple, her home that she so long talked about. After her death, Edie's memory lived on, well-respected and well-remembered in the highest annals of thought. The Washington Post called her a legendary figure in Egypt, while the New York Times proclaimed that Edie was one of the Western world's most intriguing and convincing modern case histories of reincarnation. Less than a month after her death, the BBC broadcast a documentary about her, and shortly thereafter, National Geographic did the same. But perhaps the best recording of her memory was presented by the famed British novelist William Golding, who wrote of the archaeologists he met during his travels through Egypt in the 1980s. When the question arose of a dear lady who believed herself to have been a priestess of a particular temple, they did not dismiss her as a crackpot, but agreed that she had something. So the question is, did Dorothy Edie have something? Did her life prove that reincarnation exists as so many believe? The answer to this, you will have to decide for yourself. However, there is something else. Look more deeply into the life of Dorothy Edie, and you'll realize that it might not be all about the knowledge she gave us, but the knowledge she didn't give us, 
And in fact, the secrets might go much further. While Dorothy Eadie's life story is incredible enough, after her death, many began to ask what secrets might still be out there that she only hinted at, but did not tell us about. For one, Edie always claimed that there was a secret hall of records hidden under the Abydos temple, undiscovered and filled with unseen religious texts and historical documents. She was right about the garden and so many other things about the temple. Could she have been right about this too? And if so, what secrets might this hall of records contain? Speaking of secrets, Many people who worked with Edie noted that she would walk around the temple pressing certain stones on the walls of the ruins, as if she was trying to recall a certain sequence or order. When they asked her what she was doing, she'd speak cryptically of hidden doors and portals to other places. If these portals were real, what were they capable of? And was it related to the secret hall of records? For her part, Edie always seemed privy to secret knowledge. She was known to conduct rituals in the Abydos village, which cured local people of a variety of ailments, including breathing problems, impotence, poor eyesight, arthritis, and appendicitis. When asked what she knew which allowed her to do this, she responded, Magic in ancient Egypt was a science. It was really magic, and it worked. Did she really know some sort of magic? And was it related to portals and a hall of records? In more recent times, the answers to these questions and more have begun to come trickling out. Since the time of Dorothy Eadie, the Abydos Temple of Seti I has become one of the most important and well-studied locations in Egypt, a UNESCO heritage site visited by numerous tourists and archeologists every year. For many, the most stunning part of the temple are the near endless hieroglyphic carvings and paintings depicting scenes from Egyptian mythology and history. In fact, it was when these carvings and paintings began to be examined more closely that some began to notice some truly mind-blowing things. In the 1990s, tourists visiting the temple first noticed a set of unusual carvings atop a high temple beam which shockingly appeared to depict a helicopter, a submarine, and a spaceship. At the time, some uploaded photographs of these carvings, which would become known as the helicopter hieroglyphs, to the internet, causing a brief stir before fading from view, until in 2022, they were rediscovered and went fully viral. How could these carvings exist? People asked since obviously ancient Egyptians did not have this kind of technology. Or did they? Some mainstream scientists sought to debunk the helicopter hieroglyphs by claiming they were the accidental result of older generations of hieroglyphs being plastered over and new hieroglyphs carved on top. As the new layer of plaster began to deteriorate, they claimed that it combined both layers into random patterns which resembled advanced machinery. For some, this seemed almost impossibly coincidental that, totally by chance, erosion accidentally resulted in figures that look exactly like advanced machines. Is it possible that scientists were wrong? That these helicopter hieroglyphs really do show advanced machinery? And could this be related to the secrets Dorothy Eadie insisted were buried beneath the temple? As the helicopter hieroglyphs raised questions, other researchers began to look more closely at an unusual set of paintings inside the temple, which had long been ignored. First was a painting which showed a blue bell-shaped object atop a long pole or tower. Looking closer, some suggested that the object looked exceedingly similar to the Tesla coil a device invented by Nikola Tesla in the late 1800s designed to wirelessly transmit electricity. This was not the first time evidence of an electrical ancient Egypt had been found. In fact, you can watch our video on the true purpose of the Ark of the Covenant to find out all about it. But what made this discovery unique was a second painting located on the opposite wall. This painting showed the same device, but this time attached to what is known as the Neshmet Barge of Osiris. 
To some, this barge looked exactly like an Einstein Rosen bridge, better known as a wormhole, that is, a tunnel with two different ends at separate points in space-time. Could this have something to do with the portals Edie spoke about? Could the secrets of the Abydos Temple include a way to move through space-time powered by some sort of Tesla coil? Interestingly, archaeologists have noted that long before its temple was built by the pharaoh Seti, Abydos was considered a sacred and mysterious site to Egyptians. All the way back into the pre-dynastic period, Abydos was said to be the place at which the road to the afterlife began, the location where the god of the underworld, Osiris, was buried. In other words, it was a region long associated with a journey to another place, another realm of existence. Perhaps this was more than myth. Archaeologists are really only just beginning to explore Abydos, and most of its secrets are still buried under sand. As these secrets are uncovered, what will we learn? Will we learn of portals through space-time and secret halls of records which reveal a totally different history of humanity than that which is currently in our history books? Will we learn more about the reincarnation of Dorothy Eady and the power which allowed it? Whatever the future holds, you're going to want to stay tuned to this channel to find out.